one generation after the death of the founder. What sets apart leaders who complete their business journeys or careers or disappear from our consciousness and those that leave a legacy? As you may know, yesterday we lost, and the world lost, one of the greatest phys physicists of our time, Professor Stephen Hawking. And the case of Professor Hawking probably epitomizes what today's theme is about. At age 21, he was diagnosed with what's called motor neuron disease, commonly known as the Lou Gehrig disease, and lost all body movement. He could have given up and disappeared from memory. Yet he did most of his groundbreaking work in science. For many of you who are physicists or wannabe physicists, his most piece of work was the breakthrough work in what's called the unified theory in physics. I think many of you who are physicists know that there is a kind of a contradiction between Einstein's theory of relativity and the quantum mechanics theory. Now, for many of you who want most of the details, please talk to the keynote speaker because he's an expert in this area. In fact, he said that motor neuron disease told me not to pity myself but to get on with what I could do. I'm happier now than before I developed the condition. And the lesson for us is to build a legacy behind. It's not an accident, but it's hard work. And finally, in 1982, the U.S. did, a, did a, a survey to find out the greatest president who has ever been there. And the vote landed on a man called Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president of the United States. He was known for a number of accomplishments. He, in fact, he used to kid, he used to joke about himself. He said, I'm the ugliest man around. And it was really interesting the thing that he did. But what he did to keep the union alive in the emancipation of slavery was amazing. But it's his self-awareness of the things that drove him that were really incredible. And there's a phrase that I really like to, to kind of quote for him. He said, as president, I desire to so conduct the affairs of the administration that if at the end, when I come down to lay down the reins of power, I've lost every other friend on earth, I shall have at least one friend left. And that friend shall be down inside me. And I think the lesson Abraham Lincoln was telling us, building a legacy starts with inside of you. What do you want to do? And fortunately for us today, our keynote speaker will hear through his experiences and will learn the things that he has had over time. And I hope we'll have more answers after this forum. Thank you, Tony, for the opportunity to be part of this forum. We look forward to a mutually beneficial partnership. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Mr. Patrick. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I need to mention that if you haven't served coffee, uh, please feel free. You will make your way to the serving center and serve yourself. My request is please do it um, smoothly. I don't know what, uh, what other word I would have used, but um, we are live on TV, so smile. Okay. Um, I want to invite the Director Commercial and uh, Customer Services, Mr. George O'Call from the National Water and Sewage Corporation. Uh, thank you, Maurice. Um, I want to observe all protocol. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Ajojo Cole, and as introduced, I'm working as the Director of Commercial and Customer Services, National Water and Sewerage Corporation. Uh, I stand here to represent our Managing Director, Dr. Silva Mugisha, who is unable to be here because there was a scheduled meeting with the World Bank this morning, and it's basically in line with the theme of this workshop. Uh, it's trying to negotiate some funding to support projects that will bring and build lasting legacies. Uh, when this 
conference was organized and the theme building lasting legacy amid challenges as national water we were very excited and uh, wanted to associate with this theme because we felt that our service organizations we are amid challenges but as service organizations we are here to build legacies amid those challenges and that's why we have associated with with this with this forum and we are happy to be part of the sponsors of this forum in national water we aspire to be the leading customer service oriented utility in the world that is our vision and through that vision our mission is to build really a lasting legacy and i think ever since the new leadership came into being we are on that road to build a lasting legacy i want to believe that almost all of you are using our service and are therefore a true testimony to what we are doing towards building a lasting legacy in offering service for our customers before this leadership of Dr. Silva Mugisha came in, we're in all about 24 towns. That did not reflect a national character for national water. And therefore, we took on a deliberate initiatives to ensure that we take a national character. And as I speak today, we're in about 230 towns. And that footprint we are moving rapidly to ensure that we are going to be available in the whole country. And uh, our mission really is providing water for all. And we think that in our time, and for the first time, we want to ensure that every Ugandan will have access to clean water. That is what we are looking forward to. And towards that mission, we are deliberately making initiatives in that direction. We used to provide just about 180 kilometers of water services every year, but now we provide over 1,000 kilometers annually so as to ensure that we increase services for our people. This year alone, we have extended 2,000 kilometers of water pipe network across the country. We think this should be able to increase access and indeed live within this mission of building a lasting legacy for our people. On the customer side, our motto is that the customer is the reason we exist. And for that purpose, we are doing so many initiatives to ensure that maximum convenience is guaranteed for customers who utilize our services. And I believe you already know this. We are doing so many things to ensure that you don't necessarily need to come to us to get a service. You will reach us wherever you are, in whichever form you are in. We are going ahead to even create e-branches. We do not like the brick and wall in order to be able to serve you. And in a short while, we shall be launching all those aspects. We've just completed developing a three-year strategic direction, strategic plan, that has some very key groundbreaking projects that we think will build lasting solutions for our, for our, our, our customers. We are emphasizing cost-effective projects that will release money to help us extend water
for our people. And in that direction, National Water is taking initiatives to undertake meter assembly by ourselves in the next three years. Because procurement of meters has been taking a lot of money, which money could have been released to extend services for people. Using our own expertise, we are going to assemble meters. And through that, we are going to save substantial amounts of money that will be invested to increase services for our people. We are going to innovate within the prepaid metering. And this, we are going to be doing it ourselves, right from the manufacture of the prepaid meters themselves, including the software. We are going to use our own expertise to do this, and we believe the technology itself is good, but also having done it in-house will be an issue that will build lasting legacies for our people. Ladies and gentlemen, we produce a lot of waste, and we are going to put value to that. We are going to create biofuel in the next three years from the waste that comes from the sewage treatment that we have. And we think that will have created a lot of value for our people. We are going to uh, implement a lot of green technologies for our small towns that cannot afford to use the technologies that otherwise are very expensive. We are going to be implementing a lot of green technologies that we think should be able to it provides services at a more cost-effective manner. There are many things that we'll be doing, but we want in a very structured way to be visible through the provision of corporate social responsibility for our customers. As a way of giving back, we want to ensure that in a very, very structured manner, we are visible everywhere in giving back to our customers in the next three years. And this is being planned adequately. We are building one of the biggest sewage treatment plants in, in Africa that will also be able to provide power. And this we think in the next three years. The use of power for Umeme will be supplemented by our own power that we produce. And we think this is going to release funds and these funds will be injected. Nothing but to provide services for the customer. It's my belief that those of us who are in the service industry, amid challenges, our duty is to build a lasting legacy through provision of adequate services for our people. We want to thank the Monitor for coming up with this initiative, and I want to believe that you will benefit from this forum. Thank you very much. National Water and Sales Corporation is a public utility that is 100% owned by the government of Uganda. It provides water and sewage services in urban centers across the country on a commercial and financially viable basis, serving an estimated population of over 7 million people. The number of towns is foreseen to grow as the corporation continues to pursue water for all. In addition, the corporation is implementing water supply stabilization programs in all areas as a means to increase water production and supply. This is a significant transformation in the business and service model of the corporation and has redefined National Water's role in the Uganda water sector and service delivery. Thank you very much, Mr. George Oko from the National Water and Sewage Corporation. We'd now like to invite Mr. Tony Glencross, the Managing Director at Monitor Publications Limited, Uganda's leading independent media house. And he's also the Country Managing Director for all NMG group companies in Uganda. Nation Media Group is the largest media company in East Africa and Central Africa with interests in newspapers, radio, digital, TV, printing, and courier services. Morning. I always get nervous walking up these stairs. I have a, a theory. 
or a, a, a phobia that I'll trip. Anyway, morning everyone. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to just uh, welcome Michael, our keynote speaker, to the event, and our monitor director sitting at the table over here, our sponsors, NSSF, Barclays, um, National Water and Series Corporation, Housing Finance Bank, Roofings, and the Pearl of Africa Hotel, and your rep representatives. Thank you. We couldn't do this without you. Um, so let's work together for a better going forward in terms of these events and, uh, um, and a fruitful event today. Thank you very much. Yesterday I had the privilege of um, going to the airport to meet Michael at the airport. And uh, we traveled back together, um, together in a car. It's a, a kind of a, a small mishap when we arrived. Uh, the, the driver of our limousine vanished. So we didn't have a car when, when we came out of the airport. He had gone. We couldn't find him. So we stood around for about 20 minutes until I commandeered one of the monitor staff cars. And we drove back in a small little tote to go to Corolla. But the aircon did work. But it was a good experience to spend the time with him. And hopefully he doesn't remember that as his experience of Uganda in this event. <laughs> All right. Um, I wanted to talk about a couple of things today. Uh, legacy, uh, lasting legacies uh, in spite of challenges. Um, both Monitor and ABU, which is NTV and Spock TV, have built legacy in, in Uganda as individual companies. But this year we embarked on a new journey where we, we need to build a legacy together. Traditionally the two companies have always operated as very separate companies and we will still remain as separate companies, I need to stress that. But we've embarked on a journey of what we call convergence, where we will, we will share services and outsource services to each other. The way the companies were built in Uganda is there was, it's almost like having two, two, two children. Imagine you have two kids and then each, you appoint a nanny for each kid, but you build separate houses for them and then put a wall through the middle so they grow up apart. So what we're doing now is the process is we're breaking down those walls and we're, we're taking the services that were duplicated and moving them closer together because as, as, as a combined brand sales and uh, audience offering, we are substantially stronger together than we will ever be apart. So we've merged services in terms of sales, in terms of marketing, in terms of finance, HR. So wherever there was duplication, we've, we've eliminated the duplication and we've gone with one service. So NTV outsources some of its services to monitor and monitor outsources some services to NTV. But together we provide more services and then we can work as a combined unit in the market. So it's a challenging journey, journey for us. It's not going to be easy. Um, however, uh, we will leave a legacy in the future in terms of um, moving forward and we will be a stronger operation in terms of audience delivery. Our audiences as a command operation are massive. So it's a, it's a journey that I'd like you to come along as our advertisers and customers join us on that journey and as we move forward building our own legacy in the future. Then the other thing that I wanted to talk about just briefly, when I was sitting with Michael um, yesterday in the car. We were chatting about, about many things and there were, there were several things that I learned from him. Um, but there were two in particular that I, wanted to, that I wanted to mention which I took out from our conversation. The first one was that if you make mistakes, and I'm sure we're all going to make mistakes, is what do we learn from the mistake? Yeah, uh, Daniel Kalanaki, who I talk to regularly, is always saying to me, don't waste a good crisis. How can we resolve it and how can we learn? So Michael was talking about some of the failures that he had in his early career and such like. But none of those set him back. He learnt, he grew, he adapted from them and went on to become stronger and better at his next venture. And I'm sure at this stage of the game, his success speaks for itself. And I'm sure he'll talk a little bit more about that. The other one was, which was very important to me, we were talking about uh, mobile money and M-Pesa and the success of it and why it was so successful in Kenya but such a failure in South Africa. And Michael was saying that when you introduce an innovation in a business, you have to have a leader who believes in the concept, believes in the business and drives it from the top. The problem is, and if you look at uh, M-Pesa in Kenya, it was driven from the top. I won't go into the expressions of how Michael said he got to the numbers that he wanted to get to, but uh, he, he drove it from the top. 
Whereas in South Africa, when it was introduced by Vodafone or Vodacom in South Africa, the, the leader of the country at the time was never a fundamental believer in the concept of mobile money. So after two, three years, it actually fell away and they scrapped it. And I think they, uh, MTN is looking to reintroduce it in South Africa now. But innovation has to be driven from, from the leaders of the organization. It cannot be left to the, to the, the middle management of an organization to change. So with that, uh, those were the two brief things that I took from, from yesterday. I uh, want to again thank our sponsors. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank Sarah. Where's Sarah? Sarah and your team for a good job, well done. I know they were here late last night. They've been, they've been working very hard in the last three weeks. There's probably some uh, tension in their homes because they were here. They were here till very late last night organizing everything for you. So thank you to them and a good job, well done. Uh, and now I have the privilege of introducing our keynote speaker, Mr. Michael Joseph. However, um, I think we're gonna see it on a screen, so if you'll watch the screen, and we'll do an introductory video of Mr. Michael Joseph on screen. Thank you, and I appreciate it. We're gonna build the wall, we have no choice. We condemn the burning of the Holy Scriptures in the strongest towns. Economic activity is projected to grow to an average. The Prince Captain does walk and takes a strike. Please take your seat first. Take your seat. I cannot go to the airport. We have made sense of the events around you, putting political, health, social, cultural, economic, technological, entertainment, and sports issues into perspective for all Ugandans over 25 years, reaching up to 20 million Ugandans. Today, our commitment to telling the truth through incisive journalism hasn't waned. So, to speak from the truth's point of view, read the Daily Monitor on your smartphone, tablet, laptop, and in print. <laughs> Daily Monitor. Truth every day. Mr. Michael Joseph. Michael was the CEO of Safaricom Limited from July 2000 when the company was relaunched as a joint venture between Vodafone UK and Telecom Kenya until his retirement in November 2010. During his tenure, he steered the company from a subscriber base of less than 20,000 to over 17 million subscribers. This phenomenal growth, straddling nearly a decade, was motored by the launch of many innovative products and services such as M-Pesa. Today, Safaricom is one of the leading companies in East Africa and one of the most profitable companies in the region. Mr. Joseph, a U.S. and Kenyan citizen, has a Bachelor of Science come load in Electrical Engineering from the University of Cape Town and is a member of the IEEE and IEE UK. He also has an honorary doctorate degree, Doctor of Letters, from African Nazarene University, bestowed to him in recognition of his contribution to the growth of Safaricom from very humble beginnings to becoming one of the most innovative, influential and profitable companies in the region. Michael is now the chairman of Kenya Airways, but continues to serve as Vodafone's strategic advisor on mobile money and serves on the board of Vodacom Group South Africa, Vodacom Tanzania, Vodacom Mozambique, and Safaricom Limited in Kenya. Previously, Michael was the director for mobile money for the Vodafone Group. He has international experience in company startups, the implementation and operation of large wireless and wireline networks, including operations in Hungary, Spain, Brazil, Peru, Argentina, Korea, the USA, Australia, and the Middle East. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Michael Joseph. Thank you. That's the first time I've seen something like that about me. Sometimes a bit embarrassing. But talking about embarrassing, um, before I start looking at all these cameras and, and so on and, and being seen as a guest of the Nation Media Group, 
reminded me of a, of a story that happened to me in 2003, which you, some of you may remember. But I was in a helicopter tour of the Abadez. Uh, we were funding, jointly funding with the Nation Media Group, Kenya Power, uh, and Safaricom with funding a fence around the Abadez, and we were on this inspection tour and kind of PR tour of the Abadez, and we were going to visit a village right on the northern end of, of the Abadez to, to, to encourage the villagers to embrace the fence, etc., etc. And Wilfred Kibora, and probably some of you remember Wilfred, who was then the managing director, I think, of the Nation Media Group, and, and I were in this helicopter, and as we were coming to land, um, at this, where the villagers were gathered, the, the helicopter had a problem and we crashed in the Abadez. It was, and, and the reason why I'm mentioning it is because the, the video cameras were there because Wilfred was coming and so they were going to film this in live, so it was captured on live TV. And so it was the whole thing, you could see the helicopter spinning out of control, crashing and, and uh, eventually uh, all of us managed to survive without any trouble. And the embarrassing thing for me was that I knew it was on the nation media and I knew that they would be beaming this back to Nairobi and I was scared that my wife would see this crash because I never was filmed getting out of the helicopter, everybody else was, because I was st stuck in there. And so I wanted to phone her and tell her I'm fine. Anyway, Safaricom didn't have coverage up there. So I had to borrow Wilfred's phone and he was on the opposition network and I embarrassingly had to make a call on the opposition network, which I never did again, by the way. But. Uh, <laughs> That was my uh, event with the Nation Media, and I always remember that it was a very exciting uh, time in my life in 2003 and when we crashed up there. But we survived, and thank goodness. So thank you very much to, for, for Tony for, for the introduction. Thanks to the, for the Daily Monitor, for the Nation Media, for everybody for inviting me here. It's taken quite a while for me to get here, unfortunately. In my new role with Kenya Airways, um, demands on my time are very high and it was very difficult to find the right time, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm here. By the way, I've only been to Uganda twice in my life, and this is the second time, which I'm embarrassed to say. First time I came was uh, with a project with, with MTN. But talking about a legacy, I, it's, it's something that's quite dear and, and close to my heart. Uh, and, and I believe that you know, our role in our lives, not just uh, you know, as, as people, as individuals, is to actually create a legacy in your life so that when you leave this life, you have left behind something of value. But I'm sure many business people or individuals, when you, st you don't initially start out to build a lasting legacy when you start your company or you, you assume a leadership role. You don't actually say, that's my goal, is to leave a lasting legacy. At least I didn't have that, 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 that intention when I started Safaricom in 2000. I arrived in Kenya in, in June 2000 with a team of five people from Vodafone with little knowledge of the market, the people, the socio-economic strata of the market, or even with enough money. I was told by the senior team, senior team in, in London before I left that I would probably fail, um, that the market was a bit iffy, um, that the very lot of corruption in Kenya, and our biggest customer and our majority shareholder and partner, Telcom Kenya, uh, would probably not pay their bills as well, which, would, which was initially was our biggest revenue source in the early days. Well, they were right on almost every level except the market, thank goodness. In fact, I had come to Kenya by accident, which just goes to show you never know what might happen to you in your life. I was the chief technical officer for Vodafone in Hungary, a country that I loved very much and enjoyed staying in country for its culture. I'm a great opera fan and they had opera every single night in the spring the great people, and of course it was a European country and just about to join the EU. I had aspirations to be the CEO of that company, and I want, so I wanted to stay there. But I was told by my senior people that in no uncertain terms that I was not cut out to be a CEO of a European company. I didn't have enough tact, I was not dip diplomatic enough, and I didn't have the right background. So they actually said that you should have gone to finishing school and possibly we would have made you CEO. But of course, this, I was pretty upset about this and made me even more determined. But one day, fate took a hand, and I was on a bus in, uh, going to a corporate function in Spain, actually, and I was sitting next to a guy, just talking on the way to the function, who I didn't know him, and he said, oh, by the way, you know, we've just signed a joint venture agreement with Telcom Kenya to run this mobile phone company called Safaricom, 
and we've just acquired a 40% share and uh, it looks very interesting. We've just signed it, it's taken us two years to negotiate and uh, we've just signed it the, the day before. And I said, oh, that's very interesting. Maybe I can help you there in some way. As I always wanted to go to Kenya because my original aspirations in my youth was to be a game warden. And of course, I dreamt all about Serengeti and all these places and I wanted to go see this migration. So, But the next day, as it happened, I got a call from Vodafone to come in for an interview. In London, I went to this interview. People who interviewed me had no real idea where even Kenya was or even what I was supposed to do there. But because I was the only candidate for the job, I got the job. <laughs> I don't think anybody else wanted to go. So I arrived in Kenya, sight uh, without having been before, not knowing very much, as I said, with not a lot of preparation or guidance from, from Vodafone. I had a very high level business plan probably an Excel spreadsheet, probably five pages long in those days. Uh, it said we might, in four years' time or five years' time, have 400,000 customers. We might be profitable uh, if all the winds blew in the right direction. And that is basically what had. And to match that, the total capital that I had at my, in my, my disposal at the time was $20 million. And for those of you, I think the guys in MTN will remember, in the early days of 2000, one switch cost ten million dollars so I had enough money for two switches and that's how much faith the shareholders had in this company well the rest is history of course and I can probably stop now and say well you know what happened it's a fantastic company but I think it's important that I learned some I, it's, I learned some very important lessons along the way when I came to Kenya I was at the very old age already of the retirement age actually for Vodafone of 55 because that was the official retirement age in Vodafone and I arrived in, uh, when I came there, and it was because uh, Kenya was supposedly a remote country, very dangerous country, of course, uh, for people from Europe, and because it was a long way away, and etc., etc., I didn't have much help from senior leadership in, in, in London or anything like that. So I was on my own, and I could do almost anything I wanted. Uh, probably I could have got fired as well, but I could almost do what I wanted and, and drive the company in the direction I thought it should go. And this was a really a strong uh, impetus for the legacy that I, that, that I created with, with Safaricom and, and, and Impesa. Because I, have a I had a strong conviction at that time that you were not put on this earth just to be a pure consumer. You were not here just to consume food, air, water, you heard about from the water people, have relationships, but you had an obligation, almost a divine obligation, if you will, to give back to society and to improve and to change the world around you for the better. I believe every one of us has this obligation that we're not here for our short 70 or 80 or whatever year, number of years you're on, on, on this earth just to, just to be a consumer. You're here to actually to achieve something because you know the world has been going for millions of years and your time here is a microsecond in, 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 that, in, in that scale. And so I believe that's what you have to do in your time. But we can't, of course, all be ministers of religion. We can't all be doctors. We can't all be missionaries. So we are business people. So I believe as business people, we have the same ob objective and we also have the same tools and the same intelligence to, to change the world around us, even if we are just ordinary people. And I think this is my strong conviction when I started Safaricom. So based on, on that conviction, despite what my colleagues uh, of London were telling me, I decided to change the way I was going to run this business. Initially, you know, our target market was, like our competitors, was the top of the, ba of the economic pyramid, the elite, people like yourselves. That was our target market. That was supposed to be our target market. But I decided not to do that. I decided that my target market, and this determined the success of Safaricom f for a very long time. I decided the target market for Safaricom was the men and women who came to work in a Matatu. That was my target market. And if I focused all my products and services on that, I believed that we would probably change those people's lives for the better. And by the way, we would be financially successful. But that was what I wanted to do. So when I started off, I don't know how many of you were in Kenya at the time in 2000, um, the first thing I launched was a prepaid service where people could go into a shop and buy a SIM card and, and, and immediately would have service. It didn't have to fill in a form, a long form. Now, of course, we have to because of the, of the regulation, but in those days you didn't have to do that. You just bought a SIM card and you had service. So that was the first thing I did. Secondly, I launched uh, per second billing. 
Now, for the economists in the room, uh, my competitors were on per minute billing, and actually my business, this is a very Kenyan experience. Do I wait for this microphone to come back? It says on, okay, there we go. If for people in this, economists in this room will know that if you build per second, or you, uh, you build per second, or you build per minute rather, you actually get 20 to 25% more revenue. Because you know, if you build per, per minute, uh, if it only speaks for 15 seconds, you still round it up to the, to the full minute. But I decided, because of my target market, who could probably not afford to do this, I've decided to build per second. I was ridiculed in the press a lot for that, um, but we, we, and, and opposed by, by my shareholders, but I, but I, I continue to do that. I also in, introduced uh, um, 24 hours, seven days a week free customer service, which was great because my customer base mostly didn't, first of all, they were relatively unsophisticated, and also, like every one of you, never read the manual, so I needed to have a free customer service, which my competitor didn't do. I introduced low denomination scratch cards. As you know, we actually even had a five shilling scratch card. And my CFO was, um, was horrified that I would actually do that. And he opposed it completely. But I said, that's what I wanted to do. Because as you know, most of our customers and most of your customers, you know, live from day to day. So they would buy 10 shilling scratch card in the morning and maybe buy another five shilling scratch card in the evening. But they wouldn't buy a 15 or a 20 shilling scratch card in the morning. And that's how it was. I introduced uh, low-cost phones, which is the first in, 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 in Africa, I believe. And um, I introduced, as I say, a free uh, customer service, which was in incredible. But it was a, a huge expensive operation because people used to call because it was free and because they had no money on their phone, they would call customer service just to see if the phone worked and to show people that they had a phone. And sometimes they would call to see if the weather in Nairobi was fine, you know, or to tell them about the baby or something like that. So we have one of the biggest customer service centers in, uh, in Africa. We have a 4,000 seat customer service still, and it's, it's probably the biggest in Africa, but I'm very proud of it because it was the first one with a full-time creche, with a full-time doctor, a full-time gym, and so on. So that was the key to our success, is, is focusing on, on the base of the pyramid and to change those people's lives. In fact, we were too successful. Um, we, we actually grew, we overtook our competitor in, in our second year, and we get to a million subscribers within about two, two and a half years, we got to our first million. But actually, we were, we were a bit too successful because, as I said, when we started out, we only had $20 million in our pocket, and the equipment was very expensive. And our shareholders, both Vodafone and Telcom Kenya, Telcom Kenya, because they never had the money, and, and Vodafone, because they re never really, really believed in, in, in the company, um, didn't want to put any money in, extra money in, and they didn't want to f um, uh, sign guarantees for loans. So we had to borrow from the vendor, and that took two years to negotiate that deal, mostly because the World Bank, less them, uh, opposed the deal, because Telcom Kenya still owed the money from some long time ago, and they didn't want to lend any more money. And so we had a real challenge in getting uh, money to buy equipment, which meant that for the first two years of our existence, or three years of our existence, we had lots of challenges, particularly on Friday afternoons, when people used to go home and they'd get stuck in traffic, and, and then they would call their whoever to tell them they're going to be late, and of course we had a lot of congestion. And of course we were attacked a lot in the media, I had to go to the stand and nation media and, and get all these questions and and then I don't know if you remember but there's a very famous phrase that was attributed to me wrongly I still believe that I said that Kenyans had very peculiar calling habits and I, and I didn't really mean that but what I meant couldn't they just wait until they got home to make the call why did they have to call everybody at five o'clock on Friday afternoon and uh, but anyway it, it took us a long time before we uh, we got this and when we did get the money we installed the equipment and uh, and then we grew from there and then I, uh, if you, you, there was a recent CNN interview with me where I related this enormous mistake that I made as one of the mistakes that I could not bury. There are some other mistakes that uh, I have been buried because I do believe that if you're a leader and a, and, a, and a CEO of a company, you're there to make decisions, difficult ones, sometimes easy ones, and some of your decisions will be not the right decisions. But if you make seven out of your ten decisions correctly, then you're doing extremely well. And one of the decisions I made, which was not the seven out of ten, it was the eighth and ninth one, which went badly, was I, I introduced, a, I tried to thank my customers 
for being so loyal to me during this terrible time when we had all this congestion on Friday afternoons and, and other times when it rained and things like that. And I wanted to thank them, but I wanted to give them a surprise. So I initiated a system that would give them fr uh, 200 shillings. Okay, I'm not sure. It's, that's about 2,000 Ugandan shillings, right? Is it 10 times? Hmm? 6,000. Okay, so it's 200 shillings I gave them, Kenyan shillings, free. But I did it in... <laughs>
how you can be supportive to your man how can we be supportive umanyi abantu bano bitu ala munga abana abatoro sina fetu manyo batu ala munga abana abatoro netu babi netu babi netu babi binga mm. babysit them mm. nea atoro sina fetu angara kutu ala some of the responsibility jetu ewa de mm. so beta aga a lot of support sometimes they need a lot of support responsibility za wenye nji mm. ate wakola nyo ate tu batu ala anti basaja wa ino gumila bulimbea true then where do we come in to be supportive to these our gentlemen mm. how do we identify a supportive woman if you're not one yet how can you be that mm. is where we are going to be today yes are you supportive oh <laughs> yes <laughs> yes the only person that can definitely tell mm. is is your other now is the other is, is the other person naye na usolo kwepima no garment mu bine bintu obunafu wange buliwa era bwo twa tubiyogera ko abantu banji nyo bagenda kwanga be checkinga nga muri yetu nulamu agamant nayo manye wano mpe bo kam wano ani na kuongera mu oba wano mbade sishitegera bulunji mbade nchikola nenga sishitegera bulunji katika nchikola ili dala chisobolo kubanga chivayo kubanga munange chimuyamba ate nawe kenyini nyinyi chikuyamba ebintu bino utetusobola kugaba chetu talina kakati okujja ko nge bintu bintu bilina mufe tetusobola kubanga tukikolira muntu mulala ekitegeza program eno ya kubanga it stars up ekusikula bwengo omuntu okumanya kitufu choli no kubanga okola ate waliwo nabami abalaba nibategera na manya nti omshala wange abadde supportive nga simanyi abadde supportive nga simanyi obata badde na akamu aha kakati of course atabadde nga mnyafuna okwe mulugunya ate abadde supportive nga gambo wange omshala mbadde mtu oba mbadde simuisa obulunji mm. naye ambeeride wo muyamba na tabadde muyamba konti okulaba anti ya chibera ah, so buloku la ha okuchikulira muwe opportunity kuba ba munyi mm. want to be but they mm. won't let you do yes that is very that is very true then walo banafi abanonya ngaye agenda kumanya anti omanyi mm -mm neta go muntu ali bwati ne bwati kwanga abantu banji nyo abagudde mu relationships embi oba na abantu abachamu na abachala abachamu <laughs> abachala batira nyo gamba chakati mubulira fe mukola chi mukola chi naye ensonga lwachi uh, bachala tujja kuogera nyo ku bachala is because it's the backbone mm. omuchala babanga simusanyufu mu makama kategeja kuera musanyufu omuchala babanga te yetengere detaimiri dete yerwanye ko ne gwanga te lina jirigenda ichitegeza twetaga nyo support and being that we are emotional oluse bintu yetu kola bimala netu ne ne twimala mu mungeri ate tali nnunji ne tubanga te tusoboda te kutuka ku mtindo gwa bana fa bali logical abami mm. kubanga tujja kuogera ku uh, women emancipation tujja ya kuogera ku byonna gender balance gender involvement we na tujja byogera kuna ibyo twa tubikomi ya kumimwa ngate tubitadde mu nkola tetu ina che tugenda kubera so abachala twetaganya kubanga tuli ba manyi si ba manyi kusoka abami ne aba ba manyi okubanga tusobola kubanga tusupportinga abami bano okubanga nabo basobola kola ebintu byakola ate in return kubanga chowa you expect it to be reciprocated in return era lumu tujja kuogera ko ku a man's list how he can be supportive towards a woman nayo lwali tugenda kudwelinga nyo kumchala yes kumchala ne gwengo muchala tweke bile fenna mm. tuchimanyi nti tuina obusobozi uh, buno nchimanyi nti okuva kubikula bya fe okuva kujitwa kuzibwa okuva kubachala bitu bituise mongalo yesterday nabadde ni na jenjogera keyo nga njogera ko na bazadde uh, ababa na nimbaga manti surroundings of an environment ya fe e shaping a new muntu engiri jakula Ene ne bagamba walo shino shibaga manti omuntu omugeza akyasinze yo munsi ne bintu byakoze tibiweza wadde 1% amagezi katonda gatu wadde nti a human brain has never been used to 1% i think wali ochuli wali ochuli that means we have a lot of that does that apply to all of us yes. all of our to all there is a lot of potential that is not tapped into mm. either to too many into too many now because we've had people and these things to be common mm. movies to the now and to their geniuses they have done things a bit super kumagazi gaba and to say for example you have anthunga as well doku oku oku yimu can and are defying other force of gravity using his mind that is very real typical mamu movies mm. na ye how did he do that either abantu abakola abakoze